Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the Michael Fowler Centre Auditorium for the afternoon session. Um, session today, the first session this afternoon, um, is going to be brought to us by uh, Don Christie. I'm a bit of a fanboy of Don. Uh, Don is uh, one of the directors of uh, Cattle Sty Tea and arguably the most successful um, uh, open source uh, company in New Zealand, and uh, really good to see um, what uh, open source can do in the community and watching Catalyst in action. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, put your hand together for Don Christie. Uh, thanks, Graham. Um, I've got a fanboy. Yes. Uh, welcome to LCA 2010, as they sing on the TV these days. And um, thank you very much for coming to this uh, talk. When I put in the proposal for the talk, uh, we didn't have a name for our project, which was about looking at uh, the free desktop and how it could be used in the government sector. We now have a name for the project, which is great. Uh, and this talk will describe a project that we've been running uh, for the last eight months in New Zealand. Um, and it's a project that's still going. So this is a, sort of like an interim report, if you like, um, and there's st still, still work happening. And what I'll do is describe some of the context of how we got this project off the ground, uh, what was happening in New Zealand at the time, then describe some of the scope of the work that we, uh, we've been engaging in, and uh, what sort of conclusions we've, we've reached to date. So we took this picture on the ferry on Saturday. I don't know if any of you were... We've got, we've got a few speakers that were helping, out, helping the crew out. It's a real good example of how the community came together. Um, now, the, what, the reason I selected this picture is um, we live in a country, New Zealand, where it doesn't matter whether you're part of the indigenous population or the European population or the Asian population, we all in, embarked in a voyage of discovery to come to this country. And the narrative behind this project is a narrative of, of change. And so all the various waves of migration that have come to New Zealand and countries like Australia and countries like the USA are a narrative of change and how people have coped with change and how people uh, have benefited or not from, from the change that, that was either forced upon them or that they, they chose to make. And I think once we understand that that's the underlying narrative for whatever it is we're trying to do, then we can work out uh, strategies to cope with change and help people realize um, how to manage a different mindset in their daily tasks. I, I came to New Zealand myself about 20 years ago. One of the things as, a, as a, somebody from the UK coming to New Zealand is everything feels quite familiar. People speak the same language. People look very similar to the people in the UK. But, and, and of course, you're in a delightful country, beautiful landscape, beautiful uh, weather, you know, all sorts of great things happening here. And then, and then some niggly things start happening. You know, things aren't quite the same. Things aren't working the same. The houses aren't the same. The, you know. And you can choose at that point to say, oh, fuck it, I'm going to go home. Or you can think, well, hang on. Something better is happening here. There's, there's stuff I can do here that I couldn't do elsewhere. And that's the same, same with any, anything. And I, I was working in a government agency, and there was another contractor sitting next to me from the UK, and at one point he exploded. He said, I'm sick of this fucking third fucking world fucking country. He was from Yorkshire. And, uh, <laughs> and I looked at this, and I thought, boy, you know, I'm not going to be that person. That's, that's not why I've come here. That's not why I chose, chose change. And uh, most people that do choose change discover freedoms, things that they can do that they could never do in their, in their past life. So that's a, that's a narrative. The context of New Zealand is, uh, I guess, we're not very different from a whole lot of other OECD countries. Um, since about 1999, the government has gone out and negotiated a non-contestable deal with Microsoft for uh, setting the, 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 the price of licenses for use in government. And they've renegotiated that deal every three years uh, since that time. That's had a very profound impact on IT in New Zealand, and, the, and the, I'd say the benefits are, uh, have been limited, and in fact the, the, the downside has now become very apparent. During, G June 2009, that was the, the, the last set of negotiations, um, things began to fall apart. It was quite interesting. Um, the government was sort of looking at the value that was being delivered from this deal, 
And on the other side, Microsoft was thinking, well, there's a whole bundle of other shit that we should be selling government, and uh, you know, we feel a bit constrained by this. And, and so both parties pulled apart, and they said, right, well, we're not actually going to negotiate, we'll complete this deal, which, uh, which surprised a lot of us, I suppose, and delighted us, and gave us an opportunity. So in the open source society, the New Zealand Open Source Society, we thought, right, here's a chance, actually, for the, for the first time to to, to put our money where our mouth is, to uh, demonstrate to the public sector that there are alternatives out there. And we worked out you know, a strategy for doing that. I wrote to uh, 257 chief executives of all the government agencies that run this tiny country and explained to them the idea that they, they faced a huge risk uh, and that strategically they needed to be informing themselves about what alternatives there were on the desktop software. Um, so that was the, the start of that project, and the, the, the G2009 negotiations uh, and failure of those were, were the catalyst that got us uh, going. At the same time, I was uh, reading and listening to people like Jeremy Allison, uh, who's giving a talk this afternoon, so I'll try not to, uh, to gazump him. He, he's got this talk about elephants in the room, and he's specifically referring to, to Microsoft. And for me, the Microsoft and the desktop is the elephant in the room. We have spent the last however many years in the free software community kind of trying to skirt around this elephant, trying to say, well, that bit there will never change. It's not ready for change. It's not anything we can do about it. But in fact, it's the elephant in the room. It's a rickroll of IT. The desktop, whether it's uh, your, your phone or, or, or your device for connecting to the Internet, that is the point of engagement that people have with technology. That's the point at which they engage with their email, the internet, their uh, office productivity suites, the applications. And whoever controls that desktop, and if that desktop is controlled by one company, and uh, then, then the control that they have on your IT purchasing decisions, on your government, and, and on your citizens is immense. The thing about Rick Astley, is that his song, you know, I'm never going to give you up. Do, you. do you know what I'm talking about, the whole YouTube video thing, when, when YouTube got Rick Rolled and every video you went to was Rick Astley? Anyone not know that? This is after lunch. You can all stand up and dance with me, right? But, you know, you go to YouTube and there's Rick going, never going to give you up. And then you go to another video, never going to give you up. And it's a lovely song, you know, very 1980s, beautiful song. Your mum loves Rick Astley. <laughs> But after a while, it doesn't give you everything you need. Some people need Mozart. Some people need death metal. What people need are personal productivity devices to help them do their job. Rick Astley looks nice. He sounded nice once, but by God, we've got to kick him out and get YouTube or whatever it is working again. So um, the, the other sort of uh, observation and conclusions we were coming to uh, in the society was, was this idea that government IT departments uh, were in a mindset of what we call learned helplessness, or what is called learned helplessness, which is a psychiatric condition, in that they were felt helpless to change the situation. So whenever you talk to government IT departments or business IT departments, say, look, we'd love to do this, but we can't because of blah, because of this VB script that's really important to our users because of all these documents we've got, because of all these legacy applications that we've got, because our vendor won't let us, because, you know, and it just goes on, because everyone else is using the same thing. It goes on and on. And there's no attempt to take control, take back control of, of IT. And um, the trouble is, you go to a CIO and tell them that they've lost control of their IT department, you'll be shown the door very quickly because what you're telling them is that they've done a shit job. And uh, so that's uh, an interesting dilemma. Um, but there have to be proactive moves. We have to get people out of this helpless mindset that, that they've got themselves into. And that's a key feature, I think, of, of government IT at the moment. So... Uh, we decided that uh, we needed to get government agencies collaborating. As I said, I, I wrote a whole load of them. Uh, and we needed to set up a project in which they felt safe sharing information. Um, 
safe talking to each other, safe exploring ideas without the feeling that they were being driven down a path that they might be criticized for or that wouldn't work. They could, they could experiment with things. And we were fortunate we got about 14 government agencies signed up. Um, there's uh, um, there's a, a variety. There's central government agencies, the, the department, the, sort of one of the key ones is the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. They're investigating this stuff. Uh, we've got New Zealand Post as, as a state-owned enterprise involved, and there's a regional council, um, Horizons Regional Council, which covers a big part of uh, middle New Zealand, basically, Middle Earth, that's Horizons. And we, we, we said we were going to focus on the desktop, as I said, and, and in particularly the free desktop. We have this idea, which, which I kind of call the arc of freedom, where you've kind of got proprietary stuff, locked in stuff at one end, and free stuff at the other end. And what we wanted to demonstrate was whether or not, or, and investigate how practical and how applicable the free stuff was, so that as agencies are making choices in the future, they can assess where they are on this arc of freedom, I say. Now, uh, the, in the keynote this morning, we heard some very pragmatic, important sort of like uh, business uh, drivers and, and business arguments for why free is important. So, so knowing where you are, even if you say, right, well, I'm going to stick with, with this Windows stuff because it's so beautiful and, and my users love it and they become really productive, you can know that, but, but know that your choice has understand what restrictions that choice has put on your organization and, and put a proper value on those restrictions and work out that, 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 that the, the, the loss that those restrictions cause is outweighed by the benefits. So understanding where you were on that arc of freedom was, was important to us. Um, we were hoping that the agency, there'd be enough agencies to finance a whole project. We didn't get that, but we did get uh, enough to finance a project manager and somebody to do documentation, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and we did get support from local IT companies. There's a couple in the room here today, so I'll, I'll mention them technology-wise in Tauranga and uh, open system specialists in Auckland have been who have experience in, in uh, applying free software to business solutions and schools and all that sort of stuff, it have been providing invaluable support to the project. Um, so I go on. The scope of the project, we, we, you know, we could have gone for everything. We could have uh, gone right back into the server room, right back out to the cloud. Uh, but, as I said, the elephant in the room is the desktop. So the scope of this project was to focus on the desktop. And by doing that, by narrowing that scope, we kind of also made things a bit harder for ourselves. Because if you narrow down the scope to the desktop, what you're saying is that that desktop has to work with all the existing back-end systems. It has to work with your document management systems. It has to work with your legacy applications. So that was a challenge, and that was a challenge that we thought it was important to take on. Because the idea that uh, any department or any uh, uh, organization can, can undergo wholesale change in one fell swoop is generally not uh, uh, something that uh, businesses will accept. It's, they, they see it as too risky. So if we could demonstrate that they could actually replace these components and, and, and here were the issues that they would have to address and uh, here is where they could get to and how they could get to it, then... Uh, that would give them a pathway uh, to, to making changes in their um, organizations. During the, the very, very first workshop uh, that we carried out, we kind of did, did a lot of things, but one of the first things we did was ask these um, uh, IT managers, CIOs, and so on, uh, why freedom was important to, to them and to, to their organizations and to their business. And this was establishing the business drivers. And, Unfortunately, I think at this conference we've, we've covered a lot of these issues and, and, and so none of this stuff um, should be particularly... Hey, those slides get cut off. Why is that? Um, should be particularly uh, uh, new now after, after day three of the, of the conf conference. But, you know, it's about competition. There's no contestability on the desktop. When agencies go out to buy, to upgrade their licenses, buy new software for the for the for new operating systems for their computers on your desktop, there's no contestability. Why is that? That's insane. Uh, I can't think 
of other situations where monopolists have been allowed to get away with that. Certainly in New Zealand, we've split up our telco because we didn't like the idea that they were monopolies. We're looking at our power companies because we didn't like the way they were price gouging. So why is this allowed to, to carry on on desktop? And so issues of vendor locking, vendor capture, the, the, the anti-feature uh, argument that we heard this morning, uh, and control, control over your software, being able to build things in the way that suit your organization. You know, if you take that uh, point that 80% of what every organization does, whether they're business, government, or whatever, is the same as every other organization, what you really want to be putting your effort into and, and have control over is those points that make you different. Now, who's to say that that point isn't in your operating system or isn't in your office suite or isn't in your email engine? So this, this, these are the sort of the, some of the business drivers and, and benefits that, that, that people were, were, were discussing. It turned out that defining what should go on a standard government desktop was pretty simple, as you, as you might have guessed. What do most people do? They type documents, they answer their emails, they browse the web, they go to YouTube and uh, eBay and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, Document management, uh, actually, and records management is a, is a, is a key, uh, key thing here, which is why I've kind of included the Alfresco logo there. And so um, that side of things, the defining what a, a public sector desktop should look like is actually pretty simple. Uh, it's some of this sort of stuff that becomes harder. Uh, configuration management, how do you manage people's profiles if they... Uh, lose their machine, how do you set them up on a new one? If they want to log in another machine, what happens there? Version control, training, change control. Um, I have this concept that actually if we really want productive civil servants, we should have the equivalent of an Ubuntu uh, uh, repo in, 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 or, or, or Red Hat or whatever it happens to be on the network within the individual agencies and that there's a core set of... Um, uh, of applications that your IT department will, will support, but then there's a whole lot of other applications that we know will work well on that, on that platform, but it's up to the users to decide what's going to make them productive. Do they need to use a statistical package like R to, to help them with their finances? Do they need to you know, get a task manager instead of the shit that Evolution's giving them? Do they need to, you know, there's all this sort of stuff that they, that they could be and should be exploring. That's kind of a little bit out there when you, when you talk to IT guys. Who, they just want to turn everything into a mainframe. They've forgotten about the, the personal part of PC. Interoperation with back-end systems, I've mentioned that already. And support, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about a vendor survey that we, we've also uh, run. Policy analysis was a really major part of what we've done. There's been, in the open government uh, mini-conf yesterday, there was a lot of discussion about government policies. Um, the problem with New Zealand's 2003 policy is one, it's a bit tepid. It says, you know, it's quite, it makes a positive noises about open source and, you know, it encourages people to look at it. But what it doesn't do is recognize the fact that there's a monopoly that's incumbent that has behaved in an anti-competitive manner uh, and effectively drives all other options away from the desktop and, and also away from uh, the IT stack, whether that stack goes back into your uh, groupware type systems or up to your document management systems or, or your records management systems and so on. And so policy, the policy that exists in New Zealand is far too benign or assumes that there's far too benign an environment. So we looked at what was happening in the world and in particular those four countries. And I guess um, that those were the four countries that, that we identified as having very positive, proactive policies. And, and some of the some of the highlights of the overseas policies. Um, first of all, they, they, is a, they, they start off with very strong statements of the value that free and open source software brings, that they see this movement as driving the growth of the internet, driving innovation, driving agility, driving all sorts of things. So, so there's that clear statement that comes through all these government policies that, that we've uh, anal analyzed. And, and the other sort of common factor is this idea that there should be um, very accelerated adoption uh, of 
free and open source software because they're missing the boat, right? This stuff has been around for a long time. Every three years, we've gone to the government and said, by the way, have you looked at an open source desktop? And it's never anybody's job to look at an open source desktop. It's only somebody's job to negotiate with Microsoft every three years. So there's that acceleration thing. Uh, the Netherlands uh, have a really interesting policy, um, which uh, says, OK, well, you have to comply. And if you haven't com complied, then you have to explain why you don't comply. And if, you don't com and, it, and if you've explained, and in your explanation, you also have to set up a program which demonstrates how you are going to get to a comply state. That's quite powerful. That's the stick. The carrot is that they also have a prize for the, uh, for the, for the agency that's most, made most progress every year in, in, in adopting free and open source policy. There's, there's certainly very strong statements in these policies about preferring free and open source software. And even if you haven't used that, if somebody has written you some customized software, that, you should, that software should be available to all of government at no extra charge. And that licenses should be transferable. So if they shut down one agency, which, you know, under the current conditions, that those licenses should be transferable. In the free software movement, this kind of stuff is a no-brainer. If you want 20 people less, you're not paying for their licenses because you got it for free, as in beer free. Uh, and if you want another 5,000 people, then that equally doesn't incur extra licensing costs. Um, one of the criticisms of a lot of these policies is that they seem to lack implement, implementation strategies. And certainly in the UK, there's been strong criticism that uh, there's been no teeth. So there's no one, for example, for a free software company to go and complain to if an agency hasn't complied with government policy. There's no measurement of what's happening. And this is where Malaysia wins. So in 2002, the Malaysian cabinet took a very strong and conscious decision to start moving the, the country to, to free and open source software. And they set out this whole program, and they set up a, an agency or an organization called, is it up there, MAMPU. And they're measuring it. You know, they're, they're currently in 2010. They're towards the end, I think, of the uh, implementation program. And you can go to that website. And you can see how many agencies are using OpenOffice. You can see how many agencies... Uh, which, by the way, is kind of like right up there. You can see how many agencies are using other free and open source software. You can see how many agencies have moved off Windows and so on. And m measuring and reporting should be a key part of any policy. And that's, um, that's something that's been lacking, I think, uh, certainly in New Zealand uh, and, and by the looks of things overseas. So, so yeah, you've got to move from lip service to, to actual... Um, implementation and, and of course that's where it becomes hard in what we've done I think has produced a very good policy uh, out of this project that if they so choose to agencies can adopt um, we've kind of picked the best of the rest we've identified the fact that open standards aren't enough right and, and we kind of all know that because governments have been talking about open standards since the early 1990s as vendors, in the, as a vendor in the 1990s, I remember filling in into excruciating detail how our product complied with open standards. And yet today, I hear about applications in, government, in the government sector that are only five years old that don't comply to any bloody standard. They only comply, can run on one version of IE, one version of Windows. And, you know, so you look at the whole uh, security, IE security scare now, those agencies are helpless. They're locked in, despite the fact that they've had open standards policies for 20 years. So open standards aren't enough. Um, open data on its own is important, but it's not enough. The whole process has to be open, and it has to be underpinned by, by software. You can't pull all these things apart. Uh, the other issue that we've addressed is a, is a cloud issue. Um, you know, Wordsworth uh, had it right. Clouds are lonely. And... Uh, and at the moment, the idea that, boy, we can drive costs out of our, our IT department if only we were allowed to, to, to move to the cloud. So we've been looking at the whole software as a service type model uh, and, and looking at, at how that might work in New Zealand. You know, the application of New Zealand law 
issues of being able to, to have access to the software, being able to get your data out without any loss of uh, granularity or, 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 or information. And the other key one is hardware. You know, uh, most people in the world can buy Dell laptops with Linux on them. You can't in New Zealand. Dell specifically excludes New Zealand as a country that can buy Linux laptops. So what we want the government to do is when they're procuring hardware, for them to think about the fact that they might want to run something other than Windows on that hardware. So one of the conditions when they go to tender should be that your hardware supports XYZ operating systems. Not only that, but you should make your hardware, the same hardware, available to the country's citizens. Because a really important aspect of what government does is how it places constraints and constraints on choice to, to its citizens. So that's the uh, New Zealand policy. Um, the other issue that keeps coming up about free software, and particularly free software on the, on the desktop, is, um, oh, nobody's, nobody's supporting it. You know, we go out to tender for some of this stuff, and, and nobody, nobody, uh, nobody proposes an open source solution. And the, and the point is that, that, actually, nobody has indicated that there's an, any demand, because every three years they renegotiate the deal with Microsoft, blah, blah, blah. So we, we, we actually went out to market to the marketplace, put a, a very free software orientated worded survey uh, out to market. We got it up on the government tendering uh, site. Uh, and this survey was run by Victoria University, uh, their School of Information Management. We wanted to make sure that there was a complete um, arm's length relationship here. You know, we were collecting potentially sensitive information from vendors. But what we were able to say is that, look, there are 14 government agencies in this project. There's absolutely zero guarantee that any of them will use these services, but it does demonstrate an interest. So if you're interested in showing that, there's, that you have some capability, show us what you've got. You know, that's Vladimir Putin, by the way. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's Creative Commons. So we went, we went out to market, and, the, and actually the survey is still open. Um, and now uh, we've got 32 responses. You have to remember New Zealand's a small country. 32 is <laughs> quite a, an amazing number for, um, for this country. And, and, and the really nice thing about it is that we got responses uh, from uh, sole traders, individuals who are doing training, support, and all that sort of thing, right up through to the largest integrators. Uh, so um, that was really good. As I say, you know, responses from companies with less than 10 people to over 500 people in there. It covers a wide range of, uh, of the sort of support services you might expect, documentation, training, all that sort of stuff. Uh, all the main desktop applications uh, were, were covered. Um, interestingly, there were three with client bases of over 500 desktops. And I, I, you know, that's something I can't personally say who those are out of the surveys, but I'd love to know uh, who those are. And the, and the final thing is that pretty much consistently, Everyone's predicting revenue growth in this field, which is really encouraging, certainly um, to me, because it's those expectations that will drive the delivery of, of uh, you know, the service offerings and, and, and hopefully encourage and, and, and um, make, make organizations, especially like government, which is so risk averse, feel more comfortable that they're not just relying on crazy old Don who's full of coffee all the time to, to sort of support them. So, not that I can support them. We also got some pretty pithy feedback, um, and some of these, uh, some of this feedback. This, you know, we had these structured questionnaires, and then we had the general, like, you know, blah, dump whatever you want in there. And it's interesting how this feedback very much mirrors that sort of what are the benefits of freedom that we were getting the the IT managers to think about and talk about. So. Um, there's a real meeting of minds going on, and it's not just at conferences like this, where we kind of have been, you know, we're in this lovely echo chamber here, and it's very reaffirming, because I know when I go out the door there, somebody's going to be crapping all over me about their formatting coming from Word back to uh, Open Office and so on. But um, it's not just in these circles that, that this stuff is um, taking place. We've built a desktop distribution, just basically it's based on Karma, and distributed it. We've got, um, in February, I think, 
February and March, three agencies will be going into uh, a, a pilot. One of them is Horizons, and uh, William Gordon from Horizons is here. Hey, William, stand up. Is everyone, um, is everyone sort of sleepy from lunch? Penny, do you want to stand up and just wave your arms to show other people that you're not sleeping? So she's just, she's just tweeting or some fucking thing. <laughs> Um, uh, there, there, are, there are a couple of agencies that, uh, that are using uh, free and open source software everywhere, so they've, they've built themselves on that. One of them is the Electoral Enrollment Center, which in fact has been using it for, since before Ubuntu because their first desktop was a, was a Debian kind of remix. Um, and they've, they, they basically look after the New Zealand electoral role, so that's every single um, person in New Zealand that's over 18 should be on that roll. They've got about 110 desktops. Um, one of the things that we learn from these kind of live production case studies, uh, what, uh, sorry, so how, how do we set them up? I should uh, talk about it first. Um, Puppet is important. You know, I talked about those uh, controls for pushing out um, changes. Puppet is, seems to be brilliant. I didn't, I've got no idea how the tech guys set that up. Have I spelled Sabion right? All right, so, sorry about that. Um, Sabion uh, uh, has been used to manage people's desktop profiles so that they can go roaming, uh, they can um, you know, log into other machines and just get their profile pop up and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that works really nicely. LDAP. Uh, <laughs> I was looking at a, a, a technical wiki the other day, and it said, if LDAP breaks, we're fucked. And, um, and, and yeah, LDAP is key to everything. Um, getting open LDAP working and getting it integrating to all the, all the uh, you know, your, your network, your applications, your uh, intranets, all that sort of stuff. You know, that, when, when you get that working, it's great. Uh, groupware is interesting, always interesting. Um, uh, one project has been using Zarafa, which is, uh, has a, an AGPL uh, community version, uh, developing in Holland, has a very proactive forums. Z-A-R-A. F-A. Sorry, it's not on the slide, yeah. Um, it's got a, a, a web client which kind of mimics uh, OpenOffice. It's... Architected, you know, the things that it does are, are very good. There's some rough edges. The really nice thing about it is that every time a pat we've delivered a patch back to them, it's been accepted, uh, and they're releasing, you know, quickly. Things are changing and so on. So that's that's an option. There are other options uh, people use. And keep in mind, if you're keeping your back-end systems and you've got evolution running on your desktop, then you've just got a you, you've already got a solution for. Uh, exchange and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, as I say, jaunty karmic. Um, the, the, we had this stupid technical debate, you know, internally. Uh, uh, I think it was um, myself and, and Glenn actually, you know, because there's this: should it be Susie? Should it be? Uh, should it be? Um, you know, instead of GNOME, should it be KDE and all this sort of stuff? And you can make KDE look like this and da da da. I mean, and, and, and sort of sat back and this is idiotic. They're all great systems. You know? um, that's not the point. The point is actually just to demonstrate uh, what works well. Um, so good, not so good. Um, um, I'm just, uh, what's not so good? Not so good is the fact that we keep having to learn the same lessons over and over again. Uh, you know, whenever somebody talks about groupware uh, 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 under, under Linux or something, oh, yeah, you know, it took us ages to get it set up, and we had to do this and the other. Well, where did you fucking document the thing? Uh, you know, there's, there's not enough shared information going on here. And, and one of the goals of the project is to, is to build, over time, a database of shared information. How did you do that? And really, really, this is gelling really nicely with the Open Technology Foundation that hopefully will be set up in Australia. The, the South Australian government uh, CIO and his team are driving this, and Stephen Schmidt was talking about it yesterday. 
Um, you know, this idea that there have to be repositories. We can't keep reinventing the wheel each time something goes wrong. You know, the whole, um, the other things that, that, that are tricky and, and people need to understand carefully is, is how does document exchange work? If, pe if people are dealing a lot with uh, Word and Office users, what's, what's your workflow for your document? Should you be sending them ODF files or doc files? Uh, one of your worst enemies is the fact that Microsoft Office has an ODF plugin, <laughs> which means that if somebody sends, you, sends out an ODF document by mistake, the recipient doesn't realize that uh, they could have sent them a doc file. The problem with the ODF plugin is it doesn't work very well. It reads documents. That's great. As soon as you start editing stuff, you lose formatting, you lose track changes, you lose all sorts of stuff. So at the moment, the, the, uh, the Office ODF plugin is actually you know, something to be careful of. It's not saying that it won't improve and so on. And I think you know, one of the really neat things that governments could do is adopt ODF as their document standard. That will have a profound change on the whole sort of document exchange workflow thing. The other thing to consider is if you're just sending out documents, why, why don't you just send PDFs, right? What's, what's the point? in, in, in uh, sending documents that somebody is only going to muck up anyhow because they open it up and they've got some strange printer and a different font installed and you know, all this sort of stuff. Which gets me on to fonts. Fonts are a key proprietary lock-in. And if there's another thing that governments should be standardizing on, it's on fonts. Fonts change formatting. Fonts change the meaning of documents. If you have two columns and and they're kind of lining up, and somebody's used the space bar to get them to line up in a tab over here, and then somebody else opens a document, and it's got a different font size or font. The whole meaning of the document changes. So, so understanding those sort of things are really important, that whole, uh, you know, how do you integrate with the rest of the world? Um, What else? Top management support is critical. You know, one of the easiest ways to, uh, in fact, we were hearing, uh, I think, from Stephen uh, yesterday from Canberra about how he's tried to use a Linux desktop a couple of times within his organization and had to go back to uh, not using it for, for various reasons. It's really easy for individuals to get enthusiastic and, and change things themselves, but unless they, they, they've got the encouragement from management from the top down to, to sustain those changes, peer pressure ensures that essentially that their enthusiasm gets eroded and they will, they will move, move back. So top management support is important, but it, you know, it's not everything either. Uh, you do have to cope with individual users, with their complaints, with their, with their fear of change, with real issues uh, all the time. And uh, as I said, the stuff that you thought wasn't important, it is. Uh, I don't know, I, I, there's some features in emailing and documents and so on that I've never used. In fact, I'm, I'm not somebody who uses calendars even. I, I just don't think those things are important. But um, then you find that they are and that, the, and, and that people, if they're, again, if they're not working as, as they expect, uh, that's, that's hard for them to cope with. So lo looking forward... What's time? Five minutes? What did, what did you? Right. So looking forward, what, what are we doing uh, this year? Uh, as I said, pilots. Pilots, pilots, pilots. The more of those we can get off the ground, the better. Uh, and the second thing is politics. I think um, political leadership has now become critical. Um, we were very encouraged, obviously, by the fact that the main opposition party's ICT spokesperson, Claire Curran, was here yesterday, and she made an announcement about the Labour Party's process for uh, and I'd better be careful about the wording, for um, developing uh, an open source policy. So they're going to run an open process to develop an open source policy. Uh, and, and alongside her was a very senior MP, uh, Trevor Mallard, who was Minister for Education and uh, you know, responsible for the MED buying, uh, buying Microsoft licenses for the last 20 years as well. Um, so you know, that's quite encouraging. Uh, it'd be good to get broad political support. This is not a party political issue. Uh, you know, libertarians love, uh, love free and open source software. Economists love free and open source software. Small government people love free and open source software. 
uh, you know, socialists love it, and so on. For, for different reasons, they can just see the values that those sort of things bring. So uh, I think the political aspect is, is really important, and we're kind of working against people who have enormous access to politicians. And one of the beauties uh, of living in a small community like New Zealand is that we do have access in ways that certainly would have been harder to get in the UK or the US and to a lesser extent in, in Australia. Um, so what are the threats? Learned helplessness is still a huge threat. Peer pressure is a huge threat. And, and this last one, is everyone still working alone? You know, everyone's job is to do their job in government, right? And that job is very narrowly defined. It's nobody's job to take a, an overall view, unless you're running a centralized procurement process, which isn't the answer, sorry. Uh, you know, the idea that, that we'll dictate a process down to everyone and we'll dictate a solution down to everyone is still everyone working alone. It, what you need to have as part of people's job descriptions is an ability to take a broader view occasionally. I'm not saying on an everyday basis. They've still got to churn out their policy documents and make sure that you know, our, our schools, toilets flush and our teachers get paid and all that sort of stuff. But there is a point at which a decision is being made that, you, that, that people need to be able to say, how is this going to work in an all-of-government situation? If we go down this track, who's been down this track before? How do I find these, uh, these government communities out that will support me, but everyone is siloed in government. There needs to be a transformation uh, in, in that. And this is stealing more from uh, Jeremy Allison again. I'll, I'll just conclude. You know, Jeremy talks about Samba having addressed the Microsoft's uh, monopolies and, and their antitrust behavior with code. The New Zealand Open Source Society, our approach to address that is to rem remove Windows from the desktop. That's what needs to happen if that monopoly and that monopolistic behavior is to be broken. Uh, and that's the end of my talk, my formal part of the talk. The only person I really would like to acknowledge who isn't in the room is um, John Rankin, um, who's been responsible for putting together a lot of the thinking and a lot of the documentation and a lot of the project management for this. Uh, and without John, there'd be no public sector remix. So, thank you. Um, if anybody would like to put their hand up to make it, ask, ask a question, they may, but not until after I've had mine. <laughs> the man with the mic always has the power. Um, one of the things that we've, uh, in the open ops community, have noted right along through, uh, through problems with migrations, getting people to accept, accept open office on the, on the desktop, <clears throat> is the peer support thing. That, like um, Joe Blow has his next door neighbour or his... Um, uh, or his uh, his brother or his sister, grandma has the kids that actually provide the support for their for their desktop, and it's one of the challenges that we have, that we in the open office community anyway have, have seen right from word go. How do we deal with that in the government space as well? Are, are we looking at some ways of, of trying to develop a uh, an early adopter network, perhaps or something of that nature? Yeah, I think I think you know what. So the question, if you didn't hear. Uh, that was about how to de develop peer support, particularly for something like Open Office. I think that is something that's important. That's certainly a lesson that I'm learning. Um, and that's one of the things we hope would come out of this public sector remix project, that there are actually 14 agencies that have looked into this sort of stuff, that when the New Zealand Open Source Society removes itself, there's a sustainable community there with, with some of that information going, and there's a sustainable network. That said, it's really interesting how many people I'm running across today that are using open office at home and, and in environments that I would not have expected. There's a very, there's a growing community of open office users that will help, you know, their peers in their communities, which, uh, which is very encouraging. Jim. I have a couple of, of questions with a, an interjecting comment. The first is you talked about the um, input you got from analyzing the other users uh, around the world for 
uh, open source, the um, Malaysia you've talked about looking at their process for bringing it in and how you were able to benefit from that. How, have you been able to get access to the nuts and bolts details of things like uh, I heard Munich had mm. taken and uh, a supposedly adopted uh, open source, um, you know, and Malaysia probably had to go through various things. Are they making available what they've done in order yeah. to, you know, the, the nuts and bolts to help here? And um, and then the second, you want to do that first and then we ask the Yeah, yeah. So, so just briefly, one, one of the things, you know, this project has been running only, only for eight months and we did it... Um, we have been in a hurry. So we haven't put together implementation case studies. It's something um, that um, um, Mark Shuttleworth said that uh, Canonical would, would help us with. Uh, and, and so, in fact, if there's anyone from Canonical here, uh, I'd love to get your case studies off you. There, there does need to be a lot more sharing of case studies. That There's a lot of press. There's a lot of media articles about these uh, projects that take place. But when you, when you try and get under the under the covers, uh, getting those case studies and, and the actual real hard technical detail has, has, seems to be harder. But equally, you know, we're, we're running this on a shoestring, and you kind of need resources to pull that stuff together. So, yeah. Uh, actually, just sorry. Was, oh, yeah. Hi. Uh, sorry. Uh, just to clarify uh, the earlier point about the Office plugin, are you referring to the built-in functionality Office 2007 or the Sun plugin? Uh, I'm not altogether sure, to be honest. Uh, sorry, and um, my more important question, uh, have you done any role profiling uh, in the work that you've been doing with the project uh, for, like, standard business users or more technical people? Yeah, um, so role prof profiling is interesting. Uh, actually, I'll just shut down my laptop so the next speaker can set up if, um, if we're still talking. Um, there is this idea that, um, you know, that, that in government there are knowledge users and and technical users and power users and so on. And, and I think it's a mistake to, to um, compartmentalize people. Because if you say to, a power, to, to, to one group of people, well, you're extra special, so you're going to get this stuff, whatever it happens to be. And you say to another group of people, well, <laughs> you know, you're, you're kind of the, the, the drones, so you get this stuff. It's okay, isn't it? Nobody's going to want that stuff, right? And if you're, a, if you're a power user, what you need is flexibility. What you need are tools to do your job that are outside the box, the standard supported, you know, kind of mainframe box that IT departments deliver. Jay, um, uh, has, uh, uh, f f from uh, the shared registry service, has made a really important point that IT departments have focused on driving costs out of IT rather than on how they can empower users to become more productive to an organization as a whole. And, and so, again, these are interesting mind shifts and interesting conversations to have. And I think stratifying users is, is a mistake myself, but your mileage may vary. Can we um, perhaps carry on this conversation? <laughs> yeah. Out in, the, out in the foyer. Thank you very much, Don. Everybody. Cool. And an appreciation from the organizers. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you, can, you can now go and drink that. Uh, thank you. Our next presentation will be starting in about 10 or 12 minutes.